I talk a lot about why here at Grace we go through Scripture chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book, and sometimes we may lose sight of that, and I just wanted to kind of remind you, you know, reading the lyrics in those songs, uh, you know, sometimes if we have bad theology, we have bad thinking, then we read into things our own way, our view of God and our view of the world, and you know, when, when you say, God, you'll never let me down, to you that may mean that God you know, all these stuff is always going to work out easy and good and the way that I think it should work out. And we know if we're studying scripture, that's just not the case. I mean, we look at a account after account of people who followed Jesus and, and pursued Jesus, yet their lives ended in uh, as a martyr. Their uh, lives were ended in just tragedy from the world standpoint. But in God's economy, it was there for a reason. In fact, it's through the blood of the martyrs that we're here today and we're sitting here and, and studying the Bible and have the Bible. And so God's story is bigger than our story. And I think we need to constantly remember that as we go through trials and that we're not going through them alone, that God is there for us and with us because he's for us because of Romans 8.28, that he works to our good in his, glor our, in, in his glory and that God is working out his will and he's making the circumstances and events of our life uh, point people to him and that's our pur purpose and that's why we're here and so I encourage you in the midst of your battle and in, in the midst of your struggle to remember that uh, I grew up in churches where the culture was very much um, the fact that you know you just kind of never said anything about what you were going through that you kind of suffered alone I mean you know bring your bible bring your polished veneer but don't bring your problems to the church because we you know we just really don't want you asking questions and bring saying anything and I think a lot of this fear because fear of not having the right answer sometimes, but also just this uh, perception that those who struggled um, were some way sinning or, you know, God was punishing them. And this is not the case. And so I want to encourage our church to continue to be a church that develops a culture of just being real with one another and not feeling like we have to put on airs when we come here and to pretend like everything's good and great. You know, I read a, a quote, and it said, we only hear about the house burning down. We don't hear about the electrical problems. And that's so true, and I see that from my vantage point, that oftentimes people, by the time they come to see me, the house is on fire, and their, uh, their marriage is in shambles, or their relationships, or their finances, or whatever, are in terrible, terrible shape. And we want to create a culture where people can really have community and have relationships where you can express that stuff and be part of um, just learning and growing together and seeing how God's word applies to every different area of our life. And, and so I encourage you, I mean, we're going to have all have a, a electrical problems in our, our hearts and our lives. Why? Because we're, li we live on a broken earth, that this earth is not functioning the way that God originally intended it to function. We live in broken bodies that don't function the way that God intended them to function because of the fall, and because of sin. And we live around people who are broken as well. We live in a world where sinners uh, are the dominant factor in our culture. I mean, that's the, the dominant population. And, and so they know nothing about following God or pursuing God. Sinners sin. That's what sinners do. And so we're going to be offended by those outside the church and we're going to be offended by those inside the church because we haven't arrived yet. And people and relationships, anybody that we intersect with at any time is probably going to do something that we don't like. And so I think it's important to understand the gospel and understand that that's why Jesus came to uh, show us and to teach us what the, the whole purpose of life is. And it's, it's not about us, it's about him. But sure, we wish we had a map for how life worked out, don't we? I mean, I wish we had a, a, you know, a map given to us at birth and it said, hey, here's what you can expect. Here's going to be the good things. Here's going to be the bad things. And so we can kind of prep for the bad things. But that doesn't happen. And, and so many times when life hits us in the face and things happen, that we sit back and we question, God, what are you doing? Where is this going? What's happening here? And, and as we looked at the parables last week, that's exactly the question the disciples were asking when it came to the kingdom of God and what Jesus was doing. They were asking, where is all this going? What's going on here? And we're going to turn back to Mark chapter 4 again, and we're going to finish up these last two parables. We're looking at these three short parables that are kingdom parables. Jesus is telling us, here's what my kingdom is all about. And so the disciples, and when I say the disciples here, I'm talking about the true disciples, those who were uh, true followers of Jesus, unlike 
the masses, the crowd, the group of people who would slowly and consistently dwindle away when they realized that their messianic hopes were not going to be fulfilled in the way they thought they were going to be fulfilled. And so we can't uh, truly, uh, really appreciate that. And I mentioned that last week, that, that the expectations that the people of Israel had upon a Messiah. And we don't understand like the, the, the fact that they had been, the disciples had been um, raised in a culture where the kingdom was going to come and the Romans were going to be run out and Israel would be restored to its prominence. And even after Jesus' death and resurrection, right before his ascension, in Acts chapter 1, if you really study the Bible and read the Bible as a narrative as a whole, you see that they still don't get it, even right up to the edge of Jesus returning to, to heaven, to his Father. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they ask Jesus right before he ascends, he says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you restore the kingdom now? Is this going to happen right here? And they still didn't have a proper understanding of what the kingdom was going to happen and what was going to take place. But here's the great thing. As we sit on this side of the cross and of the resurrection and the ascension is that we have the Holy Spirit. And that was a game changer. And so when the Holy Spirit came, it helped them understand and and helped them fulfill the purpose that God had given them. But at this point in the narrative, they're asking the question, why aren't more people placing their faith in you, Jesus? Why aren't people really getting it and following you? Why are they not seeing the miracles that you're doing and saying, this is the long way to Messiah, and listening to the incredible teaching and placing their faith in Jesus and his power over nature, uh, nature, his ability to forgive sins, his ability to cast out demons. But they're confused. The religious leaders of the day, the people they look up to, these people were rejecting Jesus to the point they hated him and were already scheming in chapter 4 here to destroy him. And then I mentioned again last week that we saw earlier on that his own family, his very brothers, his, his blood kin, that these people, well, technically not blood kin, but his, his family, they were scheming to drag him away, pull him back home because he was insane. He was crazy. And so Jesus speaks these three short kingdom parables to help his disciples understand that the kingdom isn't going to come in by some great army who's going to come in and run out the Romans It's not going to be achieved by a king on a white horse who's going to come in and and destroy the enemies. The kingdom was more like a seed or like a lamp. And so let's go back to just the first verse of the parable we looked at last week, the parable of the lamp, and let's just remind ourselves of what Jesus was saying there. He said, to them, that's his disciples, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed and not not on a stand. And so... What he's saying was that the kingdom isn't maybe coming to fruition the way that you think it's going to. It's, it's not happening the way, but the kingdom is, as we learned back in chapter 1, the kingdom's at hand. It, in Jesus, the kingdom was inaugurated. The kingdom was ushered in through Jesus. Jesus is the king. And so when the, wherever the king is at, that's where the kingdom is at. And so Jesus' kingdom, that's why you could tell the disciples, the kingdom of God is, is among you. It's in your midst because Jesus was standing there. But he points to them, and this, the point he's making in this, this parable of the lamp is the idea that he's promising his disciples that what they're seeing here is just the beginning. That it's just the beginning of his revelation. He will continue his work until the truths of the gospel have been revealed. And the ultimate fulfilling occurs when Jesus returns in glory at his second coming, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so today, as we meet here as the church, we're between Jesus' first advent, his first coming, and we're waiting on the second coming. And so in this period of time that we're to wait, we understand that we've been given a task, which is to to make Jesus known, to lift him up. And we mentioned this verse in last week, and I'm going to read it one more time because it's so significant. John 14, 12, where Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will, be, will he do because I am going to the Father. So he's saying, I'm going away, but you're going to do greater things. And we talked about this last week, that the apostles, the people who he was talking to at this point, gave us the very words of God. So, 
determining God's will and, and what God desires from us, understanding who God is and his nature and his character, we find that in the scriptures. We find that in the word. But also greater things, the fact that in, uh, when Jesus uh, ascended to the cross, he probably only had maybe a few more followers than what are sitting here in this room right here. But on the day of Pentecost, that number went to 3,000. And within a few hundred years of Jesus, Jerome writes, from India to Britain, all nations resound with the death and resurrection of Christ. By 378, all nations have heard the gospel. And so greater works than these, the Holy Spirit has come and he says, I'm not going to, Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you to do this job by yourselves. That you don't do the work. The Holy Spirit works through you. And so he never asked the disciples to build his kingdom by their own strength and their own ability. He does that through the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus' program for fulfilling the Great Commission and making much of him in this world comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we've been given the task, and we haven't been just given that task. We've been given the Spirit who will work that task and speak that task through our own lives. And so that next, the next parable we see in verse 26, it speaks to this truth, this parable of this growing seed. And look what he said. Let's read that together, verse 26 through 29. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And so he gives this picture of farming And he gives this picture again of of scattering seed, a little bit different angle this time than we saw in the parable of the soils. And this year, we made a little attempt at home to to grow a few plants, and Harrison got really excited because he took some some planters and he he planted some seeds in there, and uh, many of those seeds didn't actually turn out, but some of them did turn out. And, uh, but we know what, what happens. Obviously, we have a responsibility, right? We have a responsibility in that we put the seed in the ground, we water the seed, but regardless of how great a farmer, what a green thumb you have in here today, you can't make the seed do what only God can make it do. And just the joy when you see that little shoot pop up and push through the soil, and, and, and what an amazing thing that is. And as Jesus is giving this parable, it, it just reminds me that how we as a culture, we as a people, that we are so event-motivated, so event-driven, that we think that the kingdom of God should come, you know, in a moment, that, that things should just happen. We, we live in a drive through culture. You know, we want to cruise around, order our food, cruise around. There it is. It's warm and it's piping ready for us. And this idea of a seed being sown in the ground and put in the ground and, and just how that God makes it happen, and it's not instantaneous. That's a picture of the kingdom that was coming. And so the idea behind this second parable is this. The coming of the kingdom of God is not an event. It is not contingent or dependent on human activity. The seed of the gospel prospers and grows of itself. Once the seed is sown, a process is set in motion that cannot and will not be stopped, even though its growth is a total mystery to us. So he's telling these disciples who are confused, who don't understand what's going on, he's saying, trust me, there's a process here. There's something going on here. And the thing is, we think that we can maybe make the message today more relevant to people by our crafty words and the the cool things that we say. But ultimately, even though we can set in an environment, we can make an air-conditioned room, we can make it nice and comfortable for you to sit and hear the word, the truth is that only God can take that seed and to make it grow. That's the God thing. That's what he does. And this parable is really humbling. The farmer, he plants the seeds, he goes to bed, and while he sleeps, God sends the rain, God germinates the seed so that the life grows and eventually produces a full harvest. And then God goes and he reaps it for himself. And so what is our job? Our job is 
to continually spread the seed of the fame and the glory of Jesus in every area of our life, every capacity of our life. That's our job. And as I thought about this parable and I thought about my own church experience and I thought about how that some way, somehow, it's easy to get deterred from such a simple, simple concept of making much of Jesus. Making much of Jesus, the King. You know, it truthfully doesn't take a lot of theology. It doesn't take a lot of um, understanding of, of the whole Scripture To make much of Jesus means that I just tell people, here's what happened in my life, and here's what God's teaching me through his word, and he's awesome. It's all about Jesus. But why can't we do that? Why don't we do that? Why, for so long, was I hesitant to do that, to make the king known, make his presence known, and to live out my identity as a member, a citizen of the kingdom? So turn this around to you before we read a couple of verses that talk about what God has called us to be and to live out. Why don't you make much of Jesus in your life? All right, don't let that stop like with just keeping it superficial here in your mind. Let it really sink down for a second. Think about your relationships. Think about your home life. Think about work. What stops you from making much of Jesus to those around you? Many of you do. I love it when I get texts and calls from people who say, let me just tell you, I, I, you know, I was telling this guy at work about Jesus, and he's really responding. He, he, you know, he, he's really listening. And I get those kind of texts and calls quite a bit, and, that, and that's awesome. But I sat in the same seat that you did for many years where I was hesitant to make much of Jesus, lest I be called you know, extreme or radical, or I justified it by thinking, you know, uh, they'll see it through my life. They'll, they'll, they'll just see the good things. And why it's really important, there's scripture that talks about uh, people seeing our good works and bringing glory to God. That oftentimes we need to just, uh, uh, just a regular part of our, our life and living and, and existing, the flow of our life, just, just Jesus. Let me just tell you about Jesus. Let me just lift up Jesus. And it seems to make very logical sense, but unfortunately, I'm with some of you. I didn't get this for so long, is that if I'm following Jesus, and Jesus is my Lord, he's my everything, I'm completely and utterly dependent upon him for my life after death, for my eternity, that why would I not want to proclaim his greatness and his goodness? Why would I not want to do that? So what, what's stopping you? It could be sin in your life, maybe things that you say, you know, I know Jesus doesn't approve of this, but I like it. It feels good, and so I'm going to keep doing it. Of course, you're not going to want Jesus to be made known in your life. Or maybe there's a fear of man over a fear of God. Maybe you need to just really, really mine out the character of God in this word and see who God is, and see like Isaiah said, you know, when I saw God high and lifted up, I fell on my face. I said, woe is me. I promise you, even if scripture is confusing to you, and it doesn't make sense to you, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, Jesus promised that he would help us to lead us into truth. And so you pray, and you say, look, I'm reading scripture. I don't really understand all that I'm reading, but I'm, I'm praying and asking the Holy Spirit to, to help me in this. And then there's great resources. I was telling someone the other day, just really these, these really easy Bible studies that just ask questions from the text that make you slow down and just to kind of look harder at it, and you begin to get some answers to your questions through your own taking time and probing and looking. They're really simple. They make them on, on each book of the Bible. See me afterwards, and I'll be glad to direct you in the, life, the right way on that. But they're, they're super easy resources to help you. And then one thing that I encourage you to do, as God reveals the truth of Scripture to you, to pray that back to him. Pray, God, thank you for your word here. I pray that I will take it and I will allow it to touch my relationship with Mitch Hines as I interact with him through church. God, I I tend to be very impatient with Mitch, not really, but impatient with Mitch. Thank you for showing me the truth of your word. I pray that this will just apply this truth into my life by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so 
We've been tasked to bring the kingdom, a little slice of heaven to earth, imperfectly for sure. But nevertheless, that's what God has called us to, to do, and, and we're to be about Jesus. And so a couple of verses I just want to, to just remind you of in 1 Peter 2, 9, just living out our identity of who we are in Christ. If Jesus, you claim Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, Peter says that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that why you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you just proclaim the, his goodness, what he did. He saved you and took you from darkness and made you a member of the kingdom of light. And sure, you're going to have people who ask you questions and you're not going to be able to answer those questions, but it's, it's okay. Your job is just to spread the seed, lift up Jesus. Let God take care of the rest. You can't argue or talk someone into the kingdom. You can't Give somebody enough answers to their questions that they'll all of a sudden say, oh, I get it. That's the act of God. That's God taking the seed and doing the miracle there of growing the plant, producing the harvest. And sure, it's good to go and to get answers to your questions and go back and take and, and talk and discuss. But ultimately, it's a God thing. Second Corinthians 5.20, Paul makes a similar point. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you and me. He's making his appeal through us. And what's that appeal? Be, we implore you, go tell your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Here's what God did for me, and here's what God can do for you. He can move you from a sinner and redeem you that you stand before God. The words reconcile is kind of a, maybe not a word you hear, but you're, you're, being, you're made right with God. You're declared righteous because of Jesus Christ. So we don't know oftentimes what God's going to do because we just lift up Jesus. I love those people. You know those people who kind of get it when they just talk about Jesus all the time. They just can't help it. And to me, that was kind of weird for a long time. You know, it's like, man, is that all they want to talk about, just mentioning Jesus? Jesus. It seems a little too, too out there. It seems a little too like in your face. But what I've learned about a lot of these people over the time is this. That's just who they are. I mean, you, you could identify. You see a fake. You know, you, we're pretty good at seeing when somebody's just putting on a show. But you know what I'm talking about. Those people who just talk about Jesus because that's the love of their life. That's just what they do because they're so in love with Jesus. I mean, that's what I want. I want to have that contagion about me where I just, Jesus just kind of rolls off just naturally. I've told you before, you know, in the past when I I used to distance run and spend a lot of time preparing for marathons, I didn't have to be intentional about talking about running to people. I mean, it just happened. I mean, I I just, you're like, you know, I I just want to tell you, you know, about running. I just love it. It's just part of my life. I mean, it just came out of my life because it was what I did with so much of my time and my energy, and it was my passion. And so when Jesus becomes more and more your passion, it just happens in your relationships. Until we get to that point, we probably do need to be definitely more intentional about it. But as we get into the Word and know Jesus more and more, that's just going to happen more and more naturally. And so we do the ministry that He's called us to do. We stay faithful to, in our relationships and just keep li- lifting Him up. And then He does the heavy lifting. He does the real work. We just put Him out there and lift Him up and keep doing the ministries we've been called to do for the glory of God. Everything we do for the glory of God. You know, I think about just the different ministries that we offer and we have here at the church. And today in our final membership class, we'll be talking about spiritual gifts. And we'll be talking about how you can plug into different ministries. And, 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 and for sure, we should be serving one another. And I'll look at, to talk in a minute, but we could, should definitely be in the community lifting up Jesus. But we still lift up Jesus in everything we do. It's not something that we just do at certain places. It's just part of our life. And so I think about the guys who show up here on Sunday morning to set this place up so you can sit here and hear God's word. And ladies, I, I, you know, this, that's something that you could do grudgingly and think, oh man, there I go again, I hate this. 
Or you can do it for the glory of God. Or things like deacon duty. These guys walking around helping you get seats and taking care of offering and doing all these little tasks on Sunday morning. You don't think they'd rather be sitting with their family and enjoying the service? But they're serving uh, Sunday school teachers, people who are faithfully teaching our children. There's so many different avenues that we can do, and we can do it for God's glory, or we can do it begrudgingly, out of duty and commitment. So we lift up Jesus in everything. We sow that seed through just having a, a spirit of just service. And we sow it in our families. And this is one where oftentimes, you know, we sow it and then we're like very disappointed because it doesn't seem to be received really well. I don't care how quote-unquote spiritual your kids are. Their attention span is about three minutes, right? Uh, when you sit down and start talking to them about Jesus, uh, there's a billion other things that they could be talking about and doing. Oftentimes, we're inhibited because it feels awkward talking to our kids about Jesus. And, and so oftentimes, we can think, is this really making a difference at all? I mean, is anything happening in their heart? Just continue to be faithful. Continue to be faithful. God says he's the one that gives the faith. He's the one that gives the increase. And then, as I mentioned earlier, just at work in the community and the things that we do, just sow the seed and let God do the work. I love this quote by Pastor Tim Keller. He says, we are called not simply to communicate the gospel to non-believers. We must also intentionally celebrate the gospel before them. Intentionally celebrate the gospel before them. And so it's just not about telling about Jesus. It's kind of that contagion I was talking about. Just, just that you want to just brag on Jesus. Lift up Jesus. Make much of Jesus. Because ultimately all this is about Jesus. He's the king of the kingdom. And these kingdom parables that he's given, ultimately Jesus is the king because uh, the kingdom because the kingdom is wherever the king is at. And so he is the kingdom. And so maybe today you need to hear this parable because you're frustrated with your job, you're frustrated with your ministry, you're frustrated with your kids, you're just frustrated with life in general, your marriage. You need to hear that what you do matters that your faithfulness, your consistency, you're just continuing to do the things that God has called you to do and to be the person God has already declared you to be, God takes care of that stuff that you can't take care of, that you can't do. So you trust him, you trust his word. And then the final parable, there's a lot of overlap in these three parables. The, this final one, the, uh, the parable of the mustard seed, let's read it, verse 30 through 32. And Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nest in its shade. Again, think about the context here, okay? Think about the context of the disciples. I was thinking about one of the, the jobs I had when I was younger, and uh, the guys who were on staff at this particular church, we worked for a pastor who we really had major um, ethical issues with, yet he ran pretty much a dictatorship where you had no ability to kind of speak into the situation, but all the, all the pastors, all the staff guys, we all had a similar um, point of view that something had to be done on this. And one day we were talking and we said, okay, the next time we go into staff meeting, we're going to confront some of these issues, some of these things that we felt like were just, were just not right. And so we talked it up, we went into the meeting, and me, you know, being in my late 20s and you know, uh, bold and, and sometimes maybe not real thoughtful in the choice of words and so on. You know, I, 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 took, I took the lead, man. I was ready. I, I started going, started talking, started confronting. And I was feeling pretty good, you know, because I felt like, you know, we were right that I had people that had my back and I was going strong. Just, it was feeling good. But then I got to a little break where, you know, I was kind of done with my little, my little point I wanted to make. And I looked around for, you know, okay, guys, okay, now it's time for you to step in and, 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 and give your peace. Silence. Complete silence. I mean, I was out there on this island completely and utterly by myself 
where are you guys at? All right? Where, where was all this boldness you had earlier? And that didn't turn out very well for me. I'll, I'll just let you know. And if I had to do it over again, I would approach it a completely different way. You get wiser, hopefully, as you get older. But I think the disciples felt a little bit like this. That, you know, the, the kingdom, again, the mindset was this thing's going to be huge. It's going to be big. It's going to be great. It's going to be massive. And, and, and they're here, they're following Jesus, and they're giving up everything. They've, they've left a lot of stuff in order to follow Jesus, their careers, their professions. Yet they see, and we'll see this more and more as the gospel goes along, that they're looking around and more and more people are kind of just belling out on it. They're, they're just going their way. They're, they're not following Jesus the way that they once did. And Can you imagine their surprise? Like, Jesus, this kingdom project is not really working out the way that we think it should work out. I mean, I, we thought this was going to be great, and, you know, we're, we feel pretty alone here. And Jesus speaks this parable to them to help them understand that he's not done yet. And these people who are melting away and falling by the wayside, they're not those who Jesus gave the faith to believe. They're not those who um, were going to be true disciples. Jesus knew their hearts, and their hearts were not for Jesus. Their hearts were for themselves and what they could get from Jesus. And so these people melted away. And so I'm sure, like us, they're saying, man, you know, what's in this for me? What, what's, what's going on? This is going the wrong direction. Yet Jesus speaks this parable, and he says, look, it's like this little, this little seed. And it's, it's a small little seed. It's the smallest seed that you sow in your gardens. But look what happens. It turns big. It turns great. It turns massive. And again, I can't help but to think just in our own um, understanding of Western history and civilization, just how big and great, in spite of all its sins and problems and the, the, the terrible things that the ch- has been done in the name of Jesus, how large and great the church is and how many believers there are today. And although we look around and we see that, we know that Jesus is ultimately pointing toward his final kingdom, his ultimate king, kingdom where every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you, those who did not put their faith in Jesus. And he will usher into his eternal glory all those who have placed their faith in him. That's what Jesus is pointing to. But as we're stuck here between the first advent and the second advent, don't get discouraged. Again, don't get discouraged. One of the things, one of the books I started using for premarital counseling some time back is a book called What Did You Expect? What Did You Expect? And the premise of that book is very simple. Like, don't expect too much from your future spouse, all right? Because it's one sinner marrying another sinner. And while, you know, in the early stages of courtship and dating and and getting to know one another, it feels like, you know, this is going to be so amazing. You know, somebody there, my soulmate, who's right there forever with me, and we're just going to be so together on everything to do in life. And while marriage is awesome, and we, if you're in a good marriage, that, that you're working things out for the, for the glory of Jesus, it is the most fulfilling relationship outside of Jesus. But we know it's hard. It's difficult. And so it's this idea is, what do you expect? What do you expect? And, and, and that's what I want to say for our church today. What do you expect from one another, for real? What do you expect? I think sometimes that we, and maybe some people are naturally more critically minded for one reason or another than, uh, than others, but we, we, we just want to pick people apart. We want to pick situations apart. We want to, and I'm guilty of this, reading into people's motives that just aren't there. And, and, and we have this expectation for people that we don't put on ourselves, and we wonder why relationships and situations and people get discouraged and get upset in, in the church because we don't have any patience because we don't understand the gospel. And the gospel says, just like, what did you expect in marriage? You don't abandon your spouse because they do something to offend you. What do you do? You work through it and push through it and get godly counsel and encouragement. And a side note, back to an earlier illustration, don't wait till the house is on fire before you go for help. Okay? Don't wait. People always, uh, when, I, when I meet with people, I always tell them, I admire you for being here early. Because most people wait till it's way too late. There's way too much baggage, and then it takes forever. You have to work through, and some things just were never going to be worked through, uh, work, work through because there's so much hurt and bitterness and pain there. 
And God can do anything for sure. But don't wait. It's not a sign of weakness to go and ask for help in your marriage. It's a sign of strength because you understand why Jesus came. Because the gospel speaks that we're sinners and we need a Savior. And so don't wait. Seek help. But kind of on my notes, I put a little star and put extra here because that was just added in. I, I, I didn't know if I was going to say it or not, but I felt like I should have said it. But anyway, be, be patient with one another as we as the church, as we want to represent the kingdom. But he says in verse 32, he says, Yet when the kingdom, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the plants, and it puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests in the shade. And so um, this is kind of one of those deals where it could go a couple different ways to interpret what that means. Because if you were with us, or if you know the parable of the soils, and you know that in that parable, the birds represented what? The birds represented Satan who came and stole the seed away. And so some people, when they're interpreting this parable, they will say that, hey, let's be consistent. The, the birds that snatch the seed away, we have to stay with that, kind of this imagery, because these are happening, boom, 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 one after another. And so that just shows you that some people aren't going to accept the kingdom, that they're going to maybe even claim, like Judas, to be a follower of Jesus, but truthfully, they're an imposter, or they're a fake. And so this was a warning that there will be um, you know, those who are not real among your midst. That's one possibility. Regardless of whether that was Jesus' intention here or not, we know that's true, right? Or another possibility, another view, which probably seems more legitimate to me, is that this Old Testament imagery is what he's pulling out, this image of a tree, and it provides safe haven to the birds, and it's used to illustrate kingdoms that are so mighty, and they brought such stability that they brought blessing to the, to the nations around them. So this imagery of a tree is a strong nation, a strong kingdom, and it provides security and blessing to the whole earth. And that's true as well, that when we are being salt and light to this earth, when we're, we're doing what God has called us to do, that we're bringing blessing, we're bringing goodness to the world. And so to summarize the parable of the mustard seed, if you're following around, uh, along here, you can write this in your notes. God's kingdom will expand and grow for all to see. What began as the smallest becomes the greatest Unlike his first coming, when Christ returns, all the world will see as he surpasses all the earth's kingdoms in power, glory, and majesty. Everyone will eventually see the kingdom that Jesus is talking about. You know, and I just think what encouragement that is for those who do labor and it feels like it's just in vain. They're just doing it and they don't feel like they're getting any kind of really satisfaction from just continuing to be faithful to God, or those in our world who, re, who get rejected, or even worse, they face persecution for their faith. And that's so prevalent. I mean, we, we, don't, we forget that, that in the Middle East, people are dying for their faith. I was reading the other day that in one Middle Eastern co- country, they take Christians and they load up 50 in a truck, they drive them out into the desert, men, women, children. They leave them there, and they say, we're going to come back in a couple of days. If you renounce Jesus, we'll let you come back, move back into your life. So in a couple of days, they come. Who's renouncing Jesus? Get on. We're going to go back. Everybody else stays. They do that day after day until the handful of Christians who stay faithful, they die. What a terrible, awful way to go, but wow. What faith and trust in Jesus. I, you know, I, I, just, I, I don't know what I would do in a situation like that. I hope I would say, though he slay me, still I'll follow him. I hope I would, until we're in that situation. We would never know. We'd probably justify it and say, uh, you know, I'm going to go back because I think I can do more for God there than dying here. But we live in a tough world. And so these people, their labor is not in vain because they look for the hope that Jesus is going to return. He's going to come back. So the picture we get in the Gospels and as we go through these kingdom parables and we talk about the kingdom is that the kingdom is present with Jesus. It's still present in some way with the Holy Spirit here. 
but it's also still future as well. The theologians say already, but not yet. It's here already, but it's not yet come in its fullness. And why is that important? I think if we lean too far in either one direction, we can get these erroneous and false ideas. And, and here's what I'm talking about here is that some people who just see the kingdom as all future and there's no present, they don't really care about anything other than heaven. I mean, all they're focused on is this state of eternal bliss, some, you know, some people with a harp and a crown and gold streets, and it's all this future ethereal kind of, kind of existence. Well, if you study scripture, that's not the end of the story of going to heaven. The end of the story is a new heavens and a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Jesus literally, physically ruling from Jerusalem in a new earth. And so if we lean too far to just this futuristic kingdom, that's kind of maybe where we arrive at. And then for many people, it's all about just this earth. It's all this earth. And they have this naive uh, progressive dream that the church is going to eradicate sin and that they're going to bring in some kind of utopia. And that was really prevalent in the early days of the church. Not so much anymore because it's easy to look around and see that's not going so well, is it? Then the other people, they, they see the kingdom as just social justice for the poor and for the needy. We got to level the playing field. We want to make everybody you know, feel significant and important, and it's all just temporary and just localized. And then other people want to make it some political dream where, you know, if we get the right leaders in office and we defeat all the bad guys and the good guys win, then, you know, like the kingdom is happening, it's taking place. But Jesus, the kingdom that he's showed us is it's already in him, it's not yet. He's coming again. And the next time he comes, it's going to be a lot different than the first time. Because the first time he came for the purpose of the cross, it was established before the foundation of the earth, Scripture says, that he would come and he would die for our sins. And God is reclaiming his people through the cross. He's reclaiming this broken world, and eventually he'll reclaim it. But right now he's reclaiming it by the hearts of people. The kingdom of God is within you. Your heart, you turn your heart to God. You give your heart to God. So think about this kingdom idea. And, and there's a lot of confusion about the kingdom. But, you know, it's an important thing because when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, what did he say? He said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we know, we, and if you're newer to church, maybe this, you don't understand this idea of God's sovereignty, meaning that God is over everything, that God, ultimately everything that happens is under his command and his control. But also this First points you to, and Jesus' prayer points you to the fact that God truly and, real, and, and, and honestly in his sovereignty and his will not only allows but commands that people exercise their own choices in certain areas. And so there's this tension, and the Lord's prayer points that out. Jesus says, I want you to pray that in the literal, physical area around you, in the relationships around you, I want the kingdom to come. And how does that come? As we've been saying, we lift up Jesus. We lift up Jesus. We point people to Jesus. We make much of Jesus in all our relationships, in every situation that we come into contact with. And so what is heaven like? There's no evil. God is holy. His praises are sung day after day after day. And so he says, I want this kingdom to come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And our job is to bless, redeem, restore, and point people to him and live with hope. Finish up here with this last verse in Revelation chapter 19 when it talks about Jesus' return and it says 19 verse 16 on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is going to return. He's commissioned us as his church in this era between the first advent and the second advent, we are to be salt and light. Take his word. Keep our eyes upon Jesus. Keep our hope in him and lift him up and make him known. And that starts first and foremost, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. So it's not enough to talk about the kingdom. Or are you sitting there and you need to know, like, how do, how do I get to be part of the kingdom, part of Jesus and his people. 
you must be born again. Jesus came. He died. He took the sin that you deserve to suffer for eternity for. He took that on himself. And your faith in him, trust in him, not only does he give you eternal life, but he also gives you his righteousness, his holiness. You stand justified before God. That God looks at you, and he sees Jesus. And that's the only way that you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God, because of Jesus. Because if he looked at you and he looked at me, he would see the deceitfulness of my heart. He would see those words that I allow stray out of my mouth. He would see the greed and the anger and the lust that still resides in my heart and yours. But because we've been born again, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus Christ. And he's declared us righteous. And we make him known. Be reconciled. Let me tell you what God did. In spite of me, God reconciled me to himself because of Jesus. I want you to hear about that too. I want you to see that also. So be born again. Make everything about Jesus. Everything about Jesus. And live as a citizen of the kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, this task that you've given us can only be fulfilled through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we can carve out time on Sunday morning from 1030 to 1145. We can sing some songs. We can even open scripture. But unless it's all about Jesus, then nothing has happened here. And God, the same thing is true in our lives. We can rest our eternities on a decision we made somewhere in the distant past that we're really not even sure whether we believe these days or not. And we can just go on our way, living life for ourselves, for our fullness, for our satisfaction, for our dreams, and leave you back at five and six years old or ten years old when we put our faith in you, God. And help us not to rest on the past, but help us to look down, see, are we in you? Do we know you? Have we been born again? And why are we not passionate about you in our lives if we have been born again? And God, I pray that anyone here who truly knows in their heart of hearts that they've never put their faith and trust in you, they've never just given it to you, repented of their sin, God, today will be the day that they are born again and invited into your kingdom. God, pray for us as we imperfectly go about our lives. God, that we'll be humble, we'll be um, quick to admit when we, when we fall and we fail, not only to you, but God, for those around us. And God, help us to build just a slice of, of, of heaven right here at Grace Church and in this community. And may that just ripple have a ripple effect, not only in Bainbridge, but in this state, in this country, in this world. And God, be honored and glorified in our Bring us back to the main thing. It's all about you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.